in the program called What's Going On on FlintTalkRadio.com. I'm George Moss, the host of the program that comes on every Monday from 2 to 3. And don't forget, every second and fourth Mondays following this program, we have Ms. Catherine Hunter-Williams and Ms. Catherine Blake. And they bring the program on to you every two weeks, the second and fourth Mondays, called Satora's Black History Corner. And they will be on at 3.30 today from 3.30 to about 4. Hope you'll stay tuned for that program and stay tuned for the one that's here from 2 o'clock to 3. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, hold this up and ask you if you know what this is. If you don't know what it is, uh, don't feel bad. The, cons- the, uh, the government doesn't know what it is either. It's the uh, combination in this book of the Declaration of Independence, and more importantly, it contains the Constitution of the United States. And I think we need to go in and get these books and read this, this document because uh, we have got some real problems here ahead of us. And uh, you're looking at it right now as far as how it's playing out on the national stage, <clears throat> as far as the possible shutdown of the government if they can come to some kind of resolution of the problem. is now uh, going before the uh, Senate. You probably are aware of the fact that the House of Representatives passed a bill uh, last week and the bill was to, in fact, uh, fund the government with the exception of Obamacare or the Affordable uh, Care Act, as they call it, which we're now finding out that uh, the country cannot afford. <clears throat> and so the House of Representatives, which is controlled by the members of the Republican Party, have uh, passed this bill and passed it over to the Senate. Now it goes before the Senate for any uh, changes they're going to make in it, whether they, if they don't agree and uh, wholeheartedly concur with what was passed by the House. They sent it back with their recommendations <clears throat> and the changes back to the House, and they began to uh, put a committee together where the two houses will, in fact, go back and forth trying to bring about some resolutions. They got seven days <clears throat> in order to do it. And um, I wrote an article that I put on, on the Facebook wall this morning calling for, uh, uh, <laughs> calling for a shutdown of the government. So when John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, said that nobody wants to have the government shut down and nobody wants to uh, have Obamacare put in place, I was asking myself the question of when did I, my, na- my name become nobody? Because I'm one of those nobodies who's talking about that um, <clears throat> want to see the government shut down. I mean, nobody wants to see the government shut down, so that's my name now. And I, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, before the program is over, I want to see the government shut down, but not over the frivolous stuff they're talking about because they're just talking about music, musical chairs, and they're not serious about solving this problem. There is absolutely no reason to shut this government down for the nonsense that they're talking about, which is to fix the problem to December and then continue it. I want to shut it down to fix the problem so it does not become a problem in, in December nor in a time in the future. So uh, I'll tell you why I'm advocating shutting the government down, but not for this piecemeal stuff that has to do with Obamacare, <clears throat> which is, um, a, 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 what is it called, um, a um, drop in the ocean? Because that's not going to solve the problem. It's going to put them back at square one <clears throat> in December, around the 16th of uh, December, if, in fact, this deal is cut and they fix the problem for right now and then run out of money again <clears throat> in uh, three months. And got to come back together and fix the problem again and solve it for the next time period. And then I go, have to go back to the well and borrow more money to keep the government open. All of that is nothing other than the two parties showing that they're not serious. And they're not really, really interested in fixing this problem because the problem has to be fixed not just for three months, but be fixed in perpetuity so it starts being a problem. And what that means is that both parties have got to buy into <clears throat> reducing the size of government and living with his, in its means which are considerable, given the fact that we have a tax base that raises $2.5 trillion, that's with a T, and they're not willing to live within the means of $2.5 trillion a, a year. Then they got to go and borrow another $1.2 trillion, and they're printing one point, another $1.2 trillion in order to uh, meet the responsibilities of, of government that is too large, too much of a behemoth, and until we deal with that aspect of this problem, we cannot solve the problem. And they want to take on more and more responsibilities, doing more and more things, none of which are allowed for in this document right here called the Constitution, uh, much of which is uh, outlawed 
and not allowed for in the Constitution. You can just read Article 1, Section 8 <clears throat> to find that out because what is being done by the federal government is not authorized in that which enumerates the powers of the federal government, but they don't want to live within, within the means of the federal government. Let me, let me uh, before I get started on, on uh, what is going on in Washington, I want to uh, read to you um, an excerpt in this book written by uh, Dr. Thomas Woods, who is a PhD. I'm not sure what the co-author of the, of the book um, book's uh, credentials are. That's uh, Kevin R.C. Guzman. I'm very familiar with uh, Thomas Woods' uh, work, and he co-authored this book with uh, Kevin uh, Guzman, and the book is called Who Killed the Constitution? And the subtitle is The Fate of American Liberty from World War I to George W. Bush. And I'm going to read an excerpt from this very important book, Who Killed the Constitution? Because the Constitution is in this country has been, and I hate to say this, but I have to say what is true, and that is this Constitution has been shot dead, and we don't have to ask the question who killed it, the government killed it. And here's what they say on the inside cover of this book, none of which is uh, hyperbole, and none of it which is an exaggeration. It says, the United States Constitution, the bedrock of our country, the foundation of our federal republic, is, and they put three dots there, is, to emphasize the word that's following, dead. The United States Constitution, the bedrock, they should have said the supposed bedrock of our country, the foundation of our federal republic, <clears throat> is dead. They go on to say, you won't hear that from the politicians who endlessly pay lip service to the Constitution. It's the dirty little secret that best-selling authors Thomas Woods and Kevin Guzman expose in their provocative new book. The fact is that government officials, Democrats and Republicans, presidents, judges, and congressmen alike, long ago rejected the idea that the Constitution possesses a fixed meaning limiting the U.S. government's power. A fixed meaning, meaning that the words mean what they say, and the implication of the words is left to people's imagination, but what it says is what it says, and a strict interpretation of the Constitution means that the words are written, and therefore the language can be understood, to mean something specific, not meaning everything to all people given how you feel about it and based upon your political ideology and outlook and the political circumstances of the country. Here's what's written and what's written does have a meaning. So the question of who killed the Constitution, I think it's pretty obvious that the Constitution no longer applies because government will not apply it because the government does not intend to follow the mandates of the Constitution to restrict its power to doing that which is in fact allowed for in the first article of the Constitution that lays out very clearly <clears throat> what is allowed and that which is not stated is not allowed. It's very, it's very simple. You don't have to make it complex. The enumeration of powers is, okay, here are the 17 powers in Article 1, Section 8, and Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, the 18th clause in the uh, Article 1, Section uh, 8, would then be how you in fact will implement the 17 uh, itemized powers that's actually given to the Congress and through the Congress, the federal government, that beyond that, these things are not allowed. And that's where the Tenth Amendment comes in, where it says that those things that are not spelled out and given to the federal government and then not prohibited by the Constitution to the states, those powers then reside in the states or in the people therein. And, I, and that's why the Tenth Amendment is never even talked about, because if that is brought into the public uh, domain, and we are now discussing what the limitations are based upon the numeration of powers, and then 
what happens to those powers that's not delegated to the federal government, then we're talking about the state powers. And nobody wants to, uh, the people to understand that. And so what we have in, in Washington right now, quite frankly, is that we have a charade going on. And practically everybody in the Congress is, particip is participating in it. When Congress passed, finally, when the House passed, the bill that funds every aspect of the government except Obamacare and sent it to the Senate, Senator Reid, who really has to, I don't know what, is, what the problem is with um, Senator Reid, and I don't even know what the problem is in Nevada where they can elect a person over and over again uh, in that uh, mindset and send him to the Senate again after what he did in his last term and then send him up there again to do apparently more of the same during the present term. But it, um, it is uh, uh, posing a problem. He has uh, already announced <clears throat> that the uh, bill, which quite frankly doesn't even go far enough, is dead on arrival. Once it arrives in the Senate, they're going to uh, uh, send it back with the changes that they are uh, going to um, um, uh, require for a deal to be set, and that is that Obamacare has to be put into any bill that's going to be passed, uh, with both parties having to buy into it and send whatever the two gr uh, groups agree uh, to to the president for his signature, one of which is going to have to be not only the uh, putting in Obamacare, but also has it allowed the members of the Congress to uh, raise uh, the debt ceiling again for the 83rd time. And the president has said, and I don't know where he got this from, that you can raise a debt ceiling without increasing the federal debt. <laughs> uh, folks, this is not Lauren Hardy. Uh, this is not Mud and Jeff. This is the government of the United States. And what you're seeing here, living color, is a, I wish it, I wish it, 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 I wish we were talking about comedy here, but we're not talking about comedy. We're talking about what they're actually doing and what they're saying in front of our, in front of our, in the front, right in front of our faces. I mean, they're not hiding this routine behind closed doors anymore. They're putting this stuff on television and telling us right in front of our face that the that we got a clown show in Washington. And I don't know why we can't figure this out. That who's on first? There's nobody on first, and there's nobody home because this does not make any sense. What what they are doing. So the House has sent the bill over to the uh, Senate, and the bill is to define Obamacare. Now let's understand that if you define Obamacare, certain provisions of it still kick in because there are certain mandates in it that have to go that go forward, whether there's funding for certain particulars in it or not. The bill is not off the books, it's still in the books. And so that vote there is uh, ritualistic, to be honest with you, but they wouldn't even agree upon the ritualistic aspects of it. Then over in the Senate, if it's not bad enough through Senator Reid, you have this other problem you have to deal with, and that is that you got Ted Cruz, Mike Lee, and some of the others, they want to filibuster the bill that's sent over there that they agree with <laughs> they agree with the bill, but they're going to filibuster it so as to keep the Senate, where the majority of the members in the Senate are Democrats, to keep the members of the Senate from changing the bill and putting Obamacare in it. They're going to filibuster the bill, although they agree with the bill as it's been sent to the Senate by the members of the House. Folks, can we talk? Because this is uh, nothing other than a comedy uh, show. Really, if, if, um, if Ted Cruz and Mike Lee and the others were serious, and I hate to agree with uh, John McCain and Peter King here, because how do you agree with anything they're, they're saying? But they're right in, 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 in what they said here. This is all a gimmick. Because if this bill is passed for the, by, by, the, by the House, the Senate doesn't have any role here. The fact is, is that no matter what the Senate does, let them vote it um, uh, to change it and send it back to the House and let the House say that we don't go along with, with the changes. 
What you have here is the funding doesn't take place anyway, anyway regardless of what happens in the Senate. So what Cruz and, and Mike Lee are doing, they're just grandstanding. They have absolutely no role in it. And when I heard um, Mike Wallace yesterday, uh, I'm sorry, not Mike Wallace, Chris Wallace, say on Fox yesterday, uh, asked uh, Ted Cruz, uh, what is the end game? And because... <laughs> Because he was, because Chris Wallace understand that this is nothing but a charade in the Senate. It may well be a charade in the House, but that remains to be seen. I, you know, I, I already know what's happening, but you know, it hasn't played out yet. So let's say, okay, we don't know how it's going to finally play out. I mean, I do know, but it's like I, I wait. <laughs> but I know, I know what's going on there. It's all a charade. But at least in the House, they have a legitimate posture they can in fact put before the public because they do have the right to control the purse strings and that's under article 1 section 7 I'm going to read that to you before we get off the air and and, and try to talk about uh, what that means but the purse strings must start in the house so they do have the right to uh, defend it so I don't know what the Senate is doing I, Ted Cruz I don't know what you <laughs> I do know what you're doing and, 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 and uh, Chris Wallace let me tell you what the end game is. The end game is Ted Cruz wants to be president of the United States. Because otherwise, they would have let this thing play out in the Senate, let Reed make the changes in it, send it back to the House, where the House stands on its, on its principles, and then seven days later, one week from the day, the government is shut down, and they should shut it down, because they should not reach an agreement to, in fact, um, not define Obamacare, but it doesn't go far. That doesn't go far enough. The ante ought to be upped. In fact, what I said on my Facebook wall is that the government should not just be shut down. It should be shut down, now, don't get me wrong, but it should not just be shut down over defunding Obamacare. We should up the ante and go to the real problem here, and that is we got to get rid of Obamacare altogether. Because if you, in fact, just de de refuse to fund Obamacare, the, the wreckage that it is going to cause to the economy is only postponed for the inevitable collapse it's going to bring about down the road. What you got to do is close this government down now, and let's have this fight that we need to have in Congress. Let's have this fight right now. Uh, in other words, to postpone it is only going to make it worse. The government needs to be shut down until a number of things take place, one of which is um, to get rid of Ob Obamacare. If you don't do that, there's no reason to open the government up because it's going to break the bank anyway. The, co the country is going to collapse anyway on this weight. So why wait until down the road when the fixing the problem is even worse, when you need to fix it right now, where it doesn't get to the point where it, you're now going over a cliff. And you are going to go over a cliff with this, with the um, Obamacare. And you're going to go over a cliff with the, expending, with the spending that, they, that they're doing in Congress. It's unavoidable. We are on an unsustainable course. Congress doesn't get that? Then let the American people get it. Let's have that fight right now. Because if we don't have that fight now, all we are doing is kicking the can down the road to the cliff, and once we get there and we kick it, we over the cliff because there's no room left at the end. And we cannot solve this problem by postponing it. It's going to have to be dealt with. First of all, and it's not, this is, if you understand what's going on out there in the listenership and most persons that uh, listen to this program and listen to what we do here at FlintTalkRadio.com, they understand what the problem is because we talk about it almost every week. Until, until this is um, uh, resolved, we get to have a conversation about this so we are clear about what's really going on. But this is a charade that they're running. And I, I think the House is running a charade also, but there's no doubt about the fact that what Ted Cruz is doing, what Mike Lee is doing, some of the others are doing in the, in the Senate, that's all, that's all political posturing. And John McCain, I hate to say it, and Peter King in New York, they're absolutely right that this is nothing but a gimmick in terms of filibustering it for, for what end. If you filibuster it and nothing changes, the law is still in the books. And that means you go forward with because the law is already written. It's already been passed by the, by the, uh, by the Congress. I grant you that, that no Republicans voted for it, but they had enough persons in the House and 
enough members in the Senate to pass it in the Democratic Party, and that's now the, the law of the land, and if nothing, in fact, changes, that is gonna, that's going to be the law. You can define, uh, you can um, um, pick and choose. I don't know how the president even does this, but this is, again, about who killed the Constitution, where you pass a law, and then the law that you pass, that's not what we're going to enforce. We're going to particularize it so that this group is exempt from it, and this group is... <laughs> This group is exempt from it, and you don't have to uh, follow this. And here's some unions. You don't have to go along with it. And there's some more of my constituents that doesn't affect you and the members of the Congress. Okay, you can be exempted. The law is not the law because they say it's not the law. Because the law is what they say it is. And now they pass it. They have to pass in order to know what's in it. And they, now they pass it, and they know what's in it, and they don't like it as it applies to them. So they're going to change it so that that doesn't affect them, and this doesn't affect the other guys that are part and, and ladies that are part of the network and circuit. So they're going to they're going to exempt those persons. So it only falls on these people down here. And a lot of you out there having your insurance canceled. I know that from personal experience because I just got a letter myself about that, and now I got to go in and ferret out how to fix a problem that's caused in my own situation. So I know what's happening out there for, for a lot of you. Because Obamacare is uh, going to go forward anyway, and your employers are already taking uh, preventive action to prevent that program from affecting them to the point where they can't even function. You know, other thing is, too, I don't know if you heard this, too, but somebody said that um, one of the proponents that are supporting Obamacare said anybody who opposes it should be denied access to health care. <laughs> so, you know, these concerns that I have and other people have that it's going to be politicized. <laughs> if you don't agree with us, yeah. you won't get medical care. <laughs> it's realized already right out of the gate. Yeah, if you don't want, want to be steamrolled and when a steamroller runs up right over you, if you object to that, have your head, you know, plastered into the cement, uh, then you shouldn't be included anyway because you're un-American, you're unpatriotic. Yeah, I don't understand. down with the program. See, I don't understand. People can look at the history of this country <laughs> and think that socialism is right and graftable to the U.S. Constitution. You know, that you, there's no change in the society. You can still have freedom with all. You know, even if you have a socialistic, communistic society. I don't see how you can have freedom and those things because for the very things that they're going to put a gun essentially to your head to go into these kind of programs. Yeah, John. I don't see how there's freedom going to be. I say it's freedom certainly going to be sacrificed. Right, John. Uh, it it is uh, incompatible. For the government to continue to uh, take over the economy, where the health care uh, we already have with Medicaid for the um, indigent, 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 and uh, Medicare for the elderly, and now we're going to stretch the government's involvement in something they shouldn't have gotten involved with in the first place when they started putting Medicaid and Medicare in in 1965 under Johnson, who was uh, expanding upon what the New Deal had done. He was a mentor. Uh, he was mentored to by Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt, and he wants to expand upon what Roosevelt uh, did and want to create what is called the, the Great Society, which we're going to have that because the federal government is going to mandate it and put in place these things rather than letting the market determine, um, the, letting market forces uh, prevail to determine how the Great Society would play out <clears throat> where you don't have to indiv individuate it, where their personality is getting into it because the market is impersonal, where the market forces are not going to be this person or that person. It's going to be people that things that are going on because market forces are determining what will take place. That's too much freedom for the federal government. So it wants to get into it, make it about personalities where they're going to put a face on it and they're going to uh, bring this about. And, and as John was saying, uh, socialism, where the federal government now is going to uh, take over the economy is what they're doing, and now we got 40% of the economy being run by the federal government if, in fact, Obamacare goes forward. And it's going to go forward because neither party is really against uh, the uh, policies that Obamacare has brought in. It's just that they're fighting over who's going to officiate over how it plays out. It's really all just over, it's not about, it's not even about uh, uh, medical care. It's over uh, the administration of the program under the two parties, and both of them want to be the one that is having the largest, meaning the uh, political payment made to them for how it plays out in the political, economic, and the economic, the economic, political, and the social arena, they want to be the ones that are um, actually officiating over it because they want the credit for the political empowerment of their particular group. 
to the exclusion of the other group. They're fighting with power. But in terms of Obamacare, let's understand this. We, had, we already had in America the greatest mm -hmm. medical system the world had ever seen. It was the envy of the entire planet. That's undeniable. People were coming here from all over the world to get medical care. When they socialized uh, medicine in, in Canada, the Cleveland Medical Clinic that is now talking about, they got to lay off some of their employees because they can't meet the fiduciary responsibilities of, of Obamacare. They're saying that they got to now lay, they have the finest clinic in the in the world. Now, this, oh, they, no, <laughs> you know what's really ironic? Politicians are like trying to cast a like dispersions on people in the medical field, like, you know, doctors who've actually spent 12, 13 years in school beyond or 14 years beyond their school, normal schooling to become doctors. They actually like, how dare you think I'm making money? Where, <laughs> don't you want to give yourself, but yet these politicians are taking money and shut. I like to know how they can walk away with millions and millions and millions of dollars in their pockets after only getting paid 180000 a year or 200000 a year, and they walk away after a couple of terms, they're like 20, 30, 40 million dollars they have in their pockets. 50 percent of them are millionaires, and uh, you got one percent of the people in the general population of millionaires, one percent of them, and you got 50 percent of the members of Congress that are millionaires. Now, we don't see any evidence anywhere that these people are economic, you know, wizards. And uh, Dennis Kucinich is a good example of what I'm talking about here because <clears throat> Dennis Kucinich was, was the um, mayor of Cleveland and he was defeated some time ago before he ran for the, uh, a seat in the Congress. And the year after he had been defeated, his income for the following year was like $38 that he had actually earned outside of being on the, on the, on the, on the public dose. He went over and, and lived uh, for that year, first year, uh, with Shirley MacLaine, I think it was a very good friend of, uh, a very good friend of his in the uh, liberal uh, domain. And didn't, make, didn't, didn't know what to do, had no skills doing anything other than uh, operate on the public dose, and had an income reported of $38 for that year that he actually earned in the private sector. This is the kind of uh, people that want to run things, and they don't have any um, understanding of how the economy operates, but they want to be control of all these things here that has to do with uh, running running the economy of the United States. Yeah, somebody posted that on Facebook the other day. I wish I had sent that to you. There was like a, like a meme going around. They had a picture of a guy, and then in the back, in the, the foreground, you know, right on above it, it's like. Just because somebody gets elected, basically you're saying, basically you, we're electing these people who have no knowledge of anything. <laughs> the only basically thing they're winning is on a popularity contest. Yes. And that's it. They look good. They say the right things. But they don't know. I mean, they're not expertise. I mean, people like Bill Maher, everybody goes, oh, do you hear what Bill Maher said? He's got a good point. I mean, okay, he might have a good witticism, but does he have really deep thought behind it? He no, really don't. doesn't. No, they don't. Uh, there's no evidence that anybody in the Congress understands the economy. And uh, how can you understand something that, co that complex in the first place? We have 300 million people in this country, and each of them brings something to the marketplace and their decision-making among all the other stakeholders, that's all the ones that spend their money inside of the frame of the economic system, they're all stakeholders in it, and they're all making determinative um, decisions about how the economy will operate. Who knows how to do that. Everyone is playing a role in it. And for you, in fact, to assume that any one person can determine how these pieces fit together in a complex economy of the magnitude of the common United States, the largest economy in the world, is, un is nonsense. The market determines these things. And when you spend money over here and not over there, it causes decisions to be made over here. How did you know that this would be a place where you have to make these decisions. You didn't know that. This is what determined it. But they want to act like they've been sitting, <laughs> they can sit in California, for example, <laughs> and determine how much, how much income this business has that allows them to pay $10 an hour for workers at minimum wage. This is insanity, Judge. I know. It's like, well, another thing is too, man <laughs> mandating somebody's got to pay something to somebody else. If you got somebody answering the phone, you know, for like, you've got a business, you're all busy, so you have somebody answer the phone. Okay, I'm glad they take good, clear, and accurate messages, but are they worth 15, 20 bucks an hour? <laughs> I don't think so. No, I mean, they, they sit in these offices here, and they act like they can raise the standard of living up 
by just simply throwing out here a, a policy that says that, okay, you're flipping a hamburger, that's minimum wage. And so, therefore, you got to pay your bills over here. And so, that job is going to be $10 an hour. Now, forget about the fact that the man's got to sell his hamburgers. And if he's got to sell his hamburgers for uh, $5, those burgers stay inside that freezer. And therefore, more persons are laid off because they're not pushing in the hamburgers so that the amount of, of profit he's making, that goes down. And they're building a higher folks. That, in fact, is reduced. Another thing is, too, it, by doing the mandates of, like, you know, minimum wage for burger flippers, and I'm not mocking that. I've done I've done crappy jobs. I mean, I've done low-status oh. jobs. But um, by doing that, they're actually giving the advantage to the franchises, the, you know, the super chains, because they already have enough money, and they spread the risk around enough that they can actually offset one operation by money coming in from another, where the mom-and-pop place is going to be suffering. Basically, these guys are showing corporatism, not capitalism, you can only get away with it when you got a government official in your pocket or who's a sympathetic to your cause. You're probably paying and that's, that pretty and well. That, and that's why we have got to get the socialism out of the economy because that very reason that, that, that you mentioned. If you, in fact, uh, let the market determine wh what the minimum wage is, what happens is that more persons are working. They have money then they can spend, which then grows the economy at the next level which creates jobs in an expensive way that allow them to move out of those minimum wage jobs into jobs that are created by the expenditures. If you, in fact, constrict the economy down at the minimum wage level, this is not rocket science, this is something that everybody can easily see, except members of probably your Congress, and that is if you do not restrict the economy at the minimum wage levels, you got more persons working at this level down here where the masses are, they're then making money that they can spend in this part of the economy, that allows that to expand, that allows them to move up into this economy, and then they're making more money at that level, because the skill level is what they got here, plus some skills they picked up along the way. And the economy is, in fact, expanding because it's not being restricted by fiat laws put there by people that are all wise sitting in an air-conditioned office somewhere. Well, see, my um, grandparents had a restaurant here in Flint, and they, was, they opened in 1947, so Flint was still booming economically. They had some minor recessions here and there in the early stage of the 50s. But um, they um, they were doing pretty well, and the shops were booming, and they had to employ people who could have gone to the shops. So they had to make it attractive for them, so they made it fairly comparable by paying them a higher scale. That's another thing is when you're in competition with employ other employers for employees, you have to pay a going rate, otherwise you're not going to get the P those relevant positions filled. Simple fact. Simple fact. That that's the point that's made by uh, uh, this. This is made by De Lorenzo in his book called "How Capitalism Saved America." Now I know the Congress don't want to hear this, <clears throat> but capitalism will save America. And what he says in the book, I think it may well be in the first chapter of the book. So you have to read the whole book in order to get this point. And that is that uh, what they said was that. They couldn't force people off those farms to come into the factories. <clears throat> they had no power to say that we're going to uh, bring you in here and drag you in here uh, uh, as you gnash your, your teeth and screaming all the way to the uh, factory. They had to, in fact, make it more palatable to be in the shops than it was to be on the farm and make it more palatable to your income needs than you can make elsewhere. And they had to do that because the market had to determine to bring these workers off the farms into this industrial base. They had to make it fiduciarily uh, compatible with the needs of the workforce so they'd be willing to voluntarily do that because they had no power to make them comply with any of the demands of business. Business had to, in fact, uh, make it um, attractive so it could bring the result that it wanted about by, in fact, moving one part of the, work the workforce from one part of the economy to another part of the economy. The, the 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 market forces determine that. Now they want to make it appear that they can, in fact, just through magic, pass a law, and the law then does the work that the private sector, the the, the marketplace, is unable to do, and that is absolute insanity. It's what John said, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out because it's just simply uh, so it's nothing other than economics 101, which everybody understands uh, that you have got to let the market determine what the minimum wage is, where you will, in fact, uh, have the economy growing by natural means and not having it constricted by policies 
that kill off the economy. I can guarantee you right now that if you, in fact, raise that minimum wage in California, then more and more of the people in California are going to be living in Texas, as they are right now doing, because they've already raised it up to about $9. And they've learned nothing about how that impacted. I, I guess they don't even look and see, you pass a law, okay, let's see what the effect of the law would be in terms of seeing how it played out once the law is in fact passed, because everybody will tell you, and and, that, and that's everybody. That's that's. And that. you know, and you know that they have a sales tax in every county. There, mm -hmm. they can adjust their own sales tax in every county in California. Yes. yes. So could add that to the mix. It's insanity, um, and that's why California is, is dying, and uh, movies being made in places like Flint. Now we had a movie made here uh, <laughs> when they closed off downtown. And made a movie, made one of the big movies. I forget the, what the name of it was. Made a movie here in, in Flint, and we're not, and we're not a movie town. They're coming to Michigan to make movies now, not going to Hollywood, because Hollywood's in California, and who can afford doing the business out there with them making these crazy policies in California? Where, <laughs> where they're gonna tax them? They're gonna, they're gonna uh, have fewer persons working, and they're gonna tax the people at the top to death, which they then run out. Because that money can be mobile, they run out and make money elsewhere because of the policy they set in, in, in motion. And then when they pass a ten <laughs> pass a ten dollar minimum wage, you know what that does? Go ask um, uh, Walter E. Williams in his book called uh, he got a book called uh, in the title is something about socialism. I, I don't know if it's called uh, Why Socialism Doesn't Work, but something something like that. Uh, I, I can't think of the title right now, but it's, it's something dealing with uh, what we already know. Socialism does not work. And he says 90% of all economists consider the unemployment minimum wage bills to be nothing but unemployment bills. Because what happens is that when you raise the minimum wage up, then this guy and this lady have their jobs merged. So that they are paying the price for the minimum wage being increased because what they do is combine two salaries into one, have uh, two uh, having one person cut out of the two person workforce, so that now one person doing the job that once was done by two, so he's making the income, but he, but the other guy is not working. And I saw it um, uh, out there in the uh, I saw it last Friday, as a matter of fact, because. We have these little uh, green tubs that you put all of your your plastics in. You put your paper waste in. You don't put everything in there. You don't put garbage in there. But but they they want to take up the um, the paper waste and the uh, plastic waste, like plastic bottles and things like that. Put that in another container. Well, the guy that's driving that truck, uh, it's like that's not a whole lot of stuff. So just one one green can about so large at each house. So that guy's driving the truck. He has to get out of the truck, go around. I think they have the truck on the same side as, as, the, uh, as, the, as the pickup. So he gets out of the truck, climbs down, pick the uh, green uh, container up, dump it into the truck, put it back down. I do. They turn it over face down so the rain doesn't get in it. Get back in the truck and drive off. Now, there's nobody, there is nobody in the back of that truck. He's doing two jobs. Now, why is he doing that? Uh, well, listen to me close, those of you that's in government. He's doing it because you you were, you were artificially raising the minimum wage up, cut the other guy's job out. So he's making the, the new minimum wage, which is combining the earlier salary and the present salary together into one salary, and the other guy has been dismissed, and he has no salary. Thanks a lot. By the, way, <laughs> by the way, that book, is that the book you're talking about, Liberty versus the Tyranny of Socialism? That's it. Walter Williams? That's about, yeah. yeah, that was that put out in 2008. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that I read the book carefully. That's a very good book. And I didn't know what the percentage was, but he told us in that book, the percentage of e e economists that say that, well, they say what we already know, Anybody can see that if you raise minimum wage, the businesses can't absorb selling their produce at a certain price and then raising the price of labor up to the point where they have to raise the price of the product up where nobody do business with them. They go out of business with those kinds of things. So you got to find a way to cut the cost that has been put upon them by fiat laws put in place by 
these um, governmental uh, units that don't know what they're doing. So they accommodated by, in fact, merging jobs because they raised their price up to a certain pl uh, uh, price where it's prohibited. They can't sell their product. I mean, this is not chemistry. I, I see it going on in the, in the stores uh, where I, I haven't published this piece right now, but I'm going to publish it on on, on, on Facebook sometime down the road. I'm dealing right now with this government shutdown stuff, so I have not, I'm not, I have to hold off on, pub, on, on publishing this one because it's not relevant uh, to what needs to be talked about in the public domain. But I have one coming out on the 10 things we need to know about, about economics. And one of them is the impact of these uh, laws being passed, the raise of the minimum wage. It makes no sense to, to, to raise it uh, by uh, fiat laws because if you do that, then the marketplace is distorted, and you distort this part of it. Every other aspect is distorted also. It's not that it just started and, and distorted here, and it has no other effects within the economy. It's a ripple effect, where this begins a, a chain effect on everything else, like dominoes falling, and everything is affected by this one thing that you did here. And you may not be able to believe this, but there's a formula for it that I read about for the first time in Walter Williams' uh, column, uh, which was um, uh, M times M minus 1. And that formula means that if you change just one component of the economy, it, if, you, if you change six, six things inside of the economy, it creates a billion new, excuse me, a billion new possibilities inside the framework of the economy. How do you, in fact, negotiate to fix that? In other words, it's a ripple effect where this happens and some other things happen, and because that happened, these things happen. And who, what person is smart enough to um, fix a problem that has a, a ripple effect that's reverberating as a chain reaction where things are changing constantly because of, of this one thing that you, that, you, that, you, that you hit in the spider's web, and when you hit the spider's web, the entire web shakes. How do you, in fact, fix that when it has a tumbling effect? I mean, everybody knows this. Knows the thing about uh, economics. That 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 uh, that does not include uh, uh, Paul Paul uh, Krugman, who uh, doesn't understand anything about about an economy. But I'm talking about what Mises understand and what Friedman understood, what Hayek understood, and what uh, people like Thomas Sowell understand and Williams understand, and a lot of uh, those those economists that are really in the know of how the economy operate. They know what this is uh, about. And you know that in order to fix it, we got to get government's hands off of it. But now let's go back uh, uh, to the uh, uh, the premise here that I was that started out with. I want us to understand uh, what I'm going to read here in this Constitution about what is going on, because there are things that we need to know about this process. Now they are busily pulling the wool over the American people's eyes, acting like they're serious. I don't think either party, quite frankly, is serious. But it needs. We'll see how it play. I already know how it's going to play out. But I'm well. I'm, I'm willing to wait. But when it goes to the Senate and they do what they're going to do, which put Obamacare back in there, send it back to the um, to the House, where you're not going to have a committee that comes together. The way that process works, the committee comes together, and the, the committees from both the House and Senate work it out, hammer the details out, with the differences being hammered to the point where both can agree to it take it back to their respective uh, bodies, and then bring about a vote on it, and then send that particular thing to the president for a senator, where they're going to then up the ante and then increase the deficit by adding to um, the borrowing that they're now unable to, to uh, extend because they passed the last uh, increase in the deficit, and they're reaching that ceiling in another seven days, and by October the 1st, that ceiling has been reached. They've got to borrow more money, and they're going to do that. So not, they're not serious because if they were serious, it's just like it's so silly because, I mean, what they would do is very simple. They would, in fact, fix the problem where they will shut the government down until they agree to borrow no more money, abolish Obamacare, which we can't afford, let the private, let the private sector determine the cost of, of medical care in this country. Let's have the competition in all 50 states, which allow the one that comes in with the most efficient uh, means 
and therefore the best uh, price determine what the cost of insurance will be. Pare down the deficit where too much money is going to pay off the deficit. Lower the size of government, which is consuming too much of the GDP in this country, more than 25% uh, of it now being consumed by the, by the national debt, which now is approaching $17 trillion. Fix all these problems here by shutting it down until you have agreement. Because, because there's no, it doesn't make any sense to open it back up until you fix these problems. Because it's going to collapse anyway on, on, this, on the, its own weight. That is unavoidable. So we might as well stop playing the games and fix it now. I wish what they would do, by the way, is send it back to the House. Because I, I, I'm really willing to bet a dime to a donut that once it gets back into the, into the House, what you're going to see, quite frankly, is them folding tent up. They're not going to say it in these words. I was just, I was just playing. I was just fooling. They're not going to say it in those, in those terms. But they're going to send it back. They're going to make a deal. They're not going to shut the government down. And they're not going to um, de define Obamacare. They're going to simply fix a little, tweak it here, tweak it there, and then enter the economy where it does the wreckage that we've already said it's going to cause. They know it's going to cause this wreckage. They want to slow it down so the effects are not as devastating in, in the immediate time period. But over time, What's going to happen is what's going to happen. That is, we're going to eventually collapse the uh, system. And so we're going to see them uh, uh, pretending to fight over it and pretending that they're going to do they're doing something about it. Then what, what they're really doing is postponing the inevitable and put, kicking the can down the road uh, beyond the 2014 election and then into 2016 so they can continue their power grab in Washington. But nothing is going to actually change until they decide to shut it down for the reason we need to shut it down. And that is to fix the problem that is systemic inside of Washington, the Beltway. And you're not going to fix it by uh, pretending that you can defend it and then all is well because we're going to defend it. We're going to defund Obamacare up until December the 16th. We're going to raise, we're going to raise that. We're going to uh, raise the debt ceiling to 960 trillion, uh, no, I'm sorry, $960 billion, which allow us to have enough money to spend until the end of the year and then we got to come back here again and raise that ceiling again. Go, all, go through this all over again. It, uh, folks, is this serious? I mean, can we all see through this charade they're running uh, on us? It seems like none of the, neither one of the people, the, all the parties are in collusion to see the implosion of the United States economy. I mean, it does, I mean, nobody's, I mean, they're just doing token resistance. I mean, I think even Rand Paul to some degree, Ted Cruz, I mean, I think they're just doing token token you know ob objections and uh they're just still i don't understand why they're working to destroy the economy of the united states i just don't and these people are supposed to be the representatives of the people of the united states doing this to us yeah none none dare call it what it is this is um in so many words what it really is is treason but it's not deliberative treason but it plays out to say it has the same end result. In other words, what they're doing, and they don't see it in these terms, they're not actually up there saying we're going to tear the country up, we're going to uh, you know, make sure the economy doesn't go forward, make sure it doesn't grow. What they're doing is doing that which furthers the, the, the feather in their cap for political purposes. They want to further their political careers. And they're all ambitious. Run, Rand Paul wants to be president. Ted Cruz wants to be president, and John McCain, you out of here. You've already tried it, and you you saw where that went. And Cruz was saying that he was embarrassed having to vote for John McCain in 2008. And he gave, gave us those choices, and I mean, what do we do? Throw our hands up in there, pull our pull our hair out. We got a <laughs> we got a choice between Obama and McCain. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. I mean, this is it's like basically you're, you're being asked how you want to die. You be executed, <laughs> you're going to be hung, or you're going to be shot. You got your choice. I mean, yeah, you have a choice, but there's still not much options yeah. there, really. Yeah, do you want to die uh, uh, slowly, where we torture you on the way to the gas chamber? <laughs> uh, do you want to, in fact, you know, have us do the knife right now and just slit your throat? I mean, what, how, what's your method of death? You want, you want it now or you want it later? And... <laughs> Because either way, you got to get it. And to go to show you, too, I talked to people who are Obama supporters, and 
If you have any objection to health care, you're an evil person who wants to see poor people die. <laughs> you don't care about the sick and injured in this country. And it's like, no. The thing is, the way as flawed, as imperfect as the system is now, people who are uninsured do get treatment, massive amount of treatment, and you can, that's undeniable. So, I mean, I don't see where they – so now this thing is you've got to tweak the system to find out how this is better covered. But to this radical change that Obama always espouses, espouses, we have to have fundamentally change. Well, why? If why? it's working 90% of the time, why don't you tweak it to work 100% of the time instead of destroy something where it might not even work 30% of the time? Yeah, there, there is no um, utopia anywhere. And how much of the best system in the world are you able to fix? I mean, what is the problem in trying to fix that which was not broken? It wasn't perfect, but it's never going to be perfect. People are involved in it. But what is the problem in breaking a system that wasn't broken and then trying to fix the system that you broke? I'm trying to make some, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, understand, you know, what's sad or crazy, you know, are we dealing with? And I said in my article, uh, quite frankly, that I think we have to stop talking about this problem only in political terms. This problem is clinical. We got to talk about this word. This problem is also a clinical problem. There is some insanity that's, that's um, uh, reigning supreme in Washington because this is not normative. Nobody else in their private and personal life will try to fix problems like they're trying to fix problems in Washington by breaking stuff to fix it. Let me, let me read this before we get off the air. I want to read uh, Article 1, Section uh, 7. And this is in this document that nobody wants to talk about in Washington. It's called the Constitution. And this, again, shows uh, why what Ted Cruz is doing, all these people over here playing these games over in the Senate, because they want to act like they got some role to play in how Obamacare will eventually work itself out in the uh, Senate when they really are um, irrelevant into the process. <clears throat> because here's what the Constitution says in Article 1, Section 7. It says, all bills for raising revenue, and they have the word revenue uh, capitalized in the Constitution, shall originate in the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. It doesn't say anything about filibustering the bill that's sent over there. It says you can concur with it or you can alter the changes. So this filibustering of the bill is nonsense uh, because, because it's going to be overridden anyway, and the, and the Senate is going to send it back with the changes in it, and 51 persons voting for it in the Senate will, in fact, send it back to the House. And they're going to get, they're going to get 51 votes because they got more than 51 members of the Democratic Party that's going to do that. So all that filibuster is nothing but posturing on the part of Ted Cruz and, and Mike Lee and some of the others. That's just, you know, nonsense. It, the, the, the relevant party is in the House, represented by what I just read here in Article 1, Section 7. The, 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 the player is the members of the House. Now, are they serious? Well, does I think the answer there is, does a, a, a hen, you know, have teeth? And the answer in both cases is no, but we, we don't, but they are not caved yet. But wait until they get into committee and they work it out. Look, trust me, they're going to they're gonna make a deal that, that falls short of solving the problem. They're going to both declare victory because they came to an agreement. And they're not going to fix a problem that they themselves in the Congress broke because the problem need not have, have occurred in the first place. They broke the problem, now they're trying to fix that problem that they created. It's insanity. And clinically, there's a word for it. I mean, the people in Washington, these people have, you know, gone over the edge. They're pushing over us over an economic cliff. But they've already gone over the brink. Psychologically, these people, these people have lost their minds. And until we understand that we're dealing with crazy... In Washington, we can't really uh, fix this problem because because the American people need to call for a shutdown right now until the problem is fixed in its entirety. It has nothing to do with Obamacare. This is a symptom of the problem. The problem is the, the budging debt, raising the debt uh, uh, ceiling, going into more debt, spending the money of our children, our grandchildren, our grandchildren's great-grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren, Talking about the Grinch that stole Christmas. They stole Christmas, Santa Claus, and all the reindeers. <laughs> because this is not going to work. You cannot fix this problem by growing the debt. 
and I, and the president for the president to say, you know, I try to give the president the benefit of the doubt, but I can't stand this this psycho babble. When the president said last week, he was off his teleprompter, so that's why this probably was made. But when the president said, you can actually raise, get this now, you can raise a debt ceiling. Okay, it's already up here to the to the to, to, to borrow this much money, which allow us to go into debt up here to our, to, to to Yazoo. But if you raise it above where it is above Yazoo, it doesn't mean that we're increasing. <laughs> the <na> it doesn't mean we're increasing the national debt. Somebody help me with this one. I'll tell you what. I got a credit <laughs> limit on my credit cards, so I guess if I can ask them for a limit, you know, increase, then if I spend beyond that, I'm still I'm not I, I don't have to pay them back the rest of all that money, right? Yeah, uh, John, it is it's insanity. I mean, they want either that or they just simply do not have any respect for the intelligence of the American people because we all deal with, with budgets. We know that if we ask the, the credit card, once we max out the uh, credit card, and who has maxed a card out under this economy where you get to borrow money to pay your bills because you're not making an income because they're shutting down the economy. So everybody's maxing out their their um, their credit cards. Not I, not me. I understand how to use credit cards. I mean, I use their money and then pay it off before I have to pay any interest on it. That's how you ought to do it. You ought to extend your money. And you ought to ex expand your, your income by using credit cards, but not pay anything for expanding your, your wealth. Because that's why you spend it. You use the guy's money, pay it off before the interest comes in, and then wait until the bill was due, pay that off, and then charge some more money. <laughs> That's the way you do it. But nobody, but nobody believes that once you max out your card and have them raise it to a, a higher level, and you, then you go up to that level, that you're not in more debt. I don't... <laughs> I mean, I, can't, I cannot tell you any more than I've told you that this is the 12th side of crazy. I mean, I've gone to 12, the, the 12th or never. This is the 12th side of crazy. Nobody would say that if they had even a, a modicum of understanding of the economy, because that makes no sense. You're going to raise the debt ceiling, but you've not increased the amount of debt. You know, I, I went and bought, uh, you know, I bought a, uh, a freezer uh, the other day because I'm getting ready to try to pack some, some more food in, in storage because I think the collapse is inevitable. And I just hope, just hope they don't turn off the electricity and allow me to, to, to take the, the food I'm storing for a rainy day, my mother said, I'm, 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 I'm planning for a rainy day. I didn't know what she was talking about. It was, rain, was, the sun was shining, so what, what was she talking about at that time? But she meant planning for when times get hard. That's what I'm doing right now. I went and bought a freezer. So the guy wanted to give me a credit card. He said, well, let me check your credit out. And finally, I was up for credit. He looked at me and said, uh, your credit, you can get as much as $5,000. This guy decided, well, this guy came here for a freezer. But let me take him over there with the credit he got. Let, let him look at some of these television set, set, uh, sets over here. And took me over in that section, had me over here. I told him, look, I'm not raising a debt ceiling up to $5,000. That's what I'm, 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 I'm able to uh, borrow. But I came here for one reason. Give me that $765 uh, freezer. Give me all the perks with it. And I'm out of here. But the guy wanted to show me all around the store. And I was supposed to go up here to, 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 to in fact, spin up to the max. And then go beyond that once I do that. Because I couldn't pay off $5,000 in one, in one month. But I, I, you know, I restrained myself and all of that. But anybody that tells me that you can raise the debt ceiling and go up to it, which is higher than what the debt is right now, that's why you raise it, because you, you spin up this, this, this level, and you raise it up to the next level, and you have not actually increased the national debt. Either the person is a flake, and that endures out on that, <laughs> You mean, if this is this is either psychobabble or they think we're crazy. Because nobody would even mention that if they had a clue about how the economy operates. Okay, watch what they're doing. I guarantee you you're gonna see that the outcome is gonna be they're gonna call a conference, they're gonna work it out, and with the next seven days they're gonna come out and say, We got an agreement here, and they're gonna try to save us from themselves again and kick the can down the road. Nothing's gonna actually change to fix a systemic problem in terms of getting this debt under control. And uh, getting rid of Obamacare, which is a disaster for the economy now, and it'll be that in the future as well. Okay, we'll be back next week for another edition. Don't forget to stay tuned for Satora's Black History Corner, starring the two stars of FlintTalkRadio.com, Catherine Hunter Williams and 
Miss uh, Catherine uh, Blake. Till next week, I want you to follow your dream. And don't forget, if you don't follow your dream, you will absolutely never know what's on the other side of the rainbow. See you next week.